collaboration requirement. So if you choose the right fiber, because they're not created equal, and if you choose the right configuration of the fiber, if it's a wet laid non-woven, I need a certain sort of length and diameter and all of that um, versus needle punch. Uh, blend it with something else, be BFFs with whatever your favorite thing is out there, and don't talk bad about the other one. And then use it in laminates, layers, composites, and so on. That, this is our point of view. There's a, a bright future out there and, and, and a more sustainable one. I want to thank some of our engineers and techs in the labs that worked on this. I want to take, uh, thank the, the Poston brothers for um, forcing me here. Glad you did. You know, really invited me here. Devin, thank you so much for coordinating uh, everything. I, I want to list some of the fiber suppliers up there that we've worked with. There's a number of them to make all the non-wovens that we, we uh, talk about here. Uh, I want to mention one in the middle, or towards the end there, Bass Corp. Uh, these two young men are, are doing a good job there, but they started out being kind of weed smokers too, and they've gotten smart, um, if, if you will. And um, I, I was spoke, speaking to one of them last week to, to compliment because they sent us some of their latest fibers and they carved so much better than they did a year ago. This is an important point. I mean, I, I don't want to beat on them too much. The, the point I want to convey is, is that in the last 18 months, all this talk that I've heard about sustainability in the last 18 months seems to be real and people are coming to us and say, make stuff. Before that, the sustainability talk was BS. It was just talk. But I think there has been a sea change. And an example is these guys like a Bass Corp, they continue to work. And I think that that's going to continue to happen. So I think the future is a, a little bright. So I, I want to just highlight not just them, but there's some others. I, I think that uh, there will be some good things. <coughs> hey, I, I've probably gone over my time. Thank you for Thank your you freedom in doing that. Um, I, so I'm sure you won't uh, allow me any questions. But catch me if you need me to. Um, to be around at lunch. Yeah, I'll be around at lunch, and okay. we can do about that. You can um, or talk about it, and we look some of these samples if you want to. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Paul, for uh, a different look at things. Sometimes I'm at home, and, and I'm talking to my friends, and, and I saw them in the textbook business. Well, that's shirts. I said, well, it's a little more than shirts. Uh, if, we, if we look at the, the, the entire textile industry. But we're going to kind of get back to classic uh, textiles. I reckon now, uh, Brian Ashby is going to come and speak. Brian is president of Carolina Cotton Works and graduated from University of South Carolina in 1990. Brian became a CPA and worked in public accounting and then warehousing, apparel manufacturing, and distribution for the first five years of his career. And I don't know what happened after that, but uh, 95, Brian and his brother Hunter, and they're, they're joined their legendary father, Paige, the late Joe Gino, and reunited the Gaffney to start Carolina Cotton Works. At that time, CCW offered garment dyeing services as well as tubular bleaching and finishing of circular nails. During the 2000s, the company Exited the garment dyeing business and entered peace dyeing and evolved into becoming one of the most diverse dye houses in the U.S. with its technical capabilities for dyeing many fibers, surface finishing, and a blend of both open width and tubular finishing skill sets. With the unfortunate passing of Paige in 2019, Brian serves as company president as he and Hunter continue to guide CCW and reinvest for the future. Now, during his free time, Brian enjoys time with his family. You got to explain this as a boat captain for his son's high school fishing team. So please <laughs> welcome Brian. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're familiar with the concept of competitive bass fishing. 
Uh, okay, so um, it's, a, it's a phenomenon that's uh, growing a lot in the Carolinas and Georgia. But um, uh, yeah, my son is, uh, has participated for four or five years in uh, competitive bass fishing. I'm a boat captain, which means I own a boat. And we have to be on a lake uh, before sunrise, somewhere in South Carolina or Georgia, seven or eight times a year. And it's from sun up until 3-ish, 3 3.30 in the afternoon, you weigh in your best spot fish. And then whoever caught the most weight wins. And it's, uh, it's a cumulative tally throughout the season. You try to qualify for a classic, yada, yada, yada. But anyway, that's to clear up the bass fishing thing. But, uh, <laughs> by the way, most of the guys, thank you for um, uh, cornering me at my last, uh, the last time I was here, I believe it was Charles, cornered me and said, hey, can you, uh, you want to be a speaker at one of these events? I'm more am I going to say no? Um, I, I, I said, sure. Can you come to the next one? Well, sure. What do you want me to talk about? Well, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> so I said, okay. Uh, I, I, I guess I'll talk about kind of who we are, what we do, and um, everybody here's got a pandemic story. All the businesses here have some sort of pandemic story, I'm sure. We're no different. Our story might be a little bit different than someone else's. So I'll describe a little bit of that. And it was through that experience of, of going through this pandemic staffing issues, the business challenges, our customers' issues that caused Hunter and I to, what we refer to now, basically double down on our business. And I'll talk about some of those investments and, and why we made some of those choices. And I, I would like for this to be um, very interactive, so please raise your hand, interrupt, shout, <coughs> ask questions uh, or comments. Uh, as you as you like and Paul by the way I'm really pleased to know that the uh, McCarter coalition or, or um, plan in Clover South Carolina let someone else into the textile business. <laughs> <laughs> Paul's still here but yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> okay. uh, so today what I'm going to plan to talk to you guys about is um, what is CCW and what's the difference between CCW and Carolina Cotton Works uh, who is CCW? Uh, pandemic storage effects, labor challenges, and how it goes down. This is just a little aerial view of our facility. We're in Gaffney, South Carolina. It's about 45 minutes south of here on 85. It's a great drive if you want to make it sometime. <laughs> we have 175 people at this facility that work full time. Uh, it's 120,000 square feet. We've added on to it twice on 14 acres just off the interstate. So um, can I show, have a show of hands for folks that have you worked in a jet dye house before? I want to understand if you've been around jet dyeing and finishing. Okay, a few. Um, so we are what's referred to as a jet dye house. We don't knit, we don't weave, um, what we do put the color on and we add finishes as necessary. I was speaking at an event that um, I got invited to, uh, I think by maybe Cameron or his uncle or someone. Remember when I spoke at the, is it Kiwanis or Rotary, Rotary Club? I spoke at the Gaffney Rotary Club. I got invited, you know, times are hard, speakers are rare, so they found me. <laughs> And, and, and they said, hey, come and talk to our members at the Rotary Club there. Tell us about what Carolina Cotton Works. Y'all been around for 20-something years. Nobody knows what y'all do. Y'all just down in the woods in Gaffney. Um, and you need to come out and tell us about your business. So I did. And I thought it would be kind of funny. There's, there's, because Cameron, and, you know, they've got that Hamrick Mafia over there in Gaffney. And, uh, so they've got Lyle and Carlisle and all these, other, all these other guys that run the town. And, uh, and so I, I began to speak to just some members of the community who are not in the textile business. And I said, well, the best way I can tell you is we, we actually buy some fabrics from places like Inman Mills and, and, and uh, Clover Knits. And, and well, 
hammer mills, and we, we get what they make, and we make it sexy because we add color to it. We make it soft, and we make it do all these things. And I remember Cameron's uncle said, well, we, knew, we all learned how to color when we were in kindergarten. Boy, <laughs> 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 you tapped me right back. <laughs> So anyway, um, all in good fun. Um, in jet dyeing, these are, and I've got a couple slides of, of what we mean by jets, but we, we piece dye fabric, typically in the neighborhood of 1,000 pounds to 2,000 pounds at a time. And we've carved a little bit of a niche for ourselves here in, in our ability to do lots of different things. Uh, you can see on the list here the various uh, fibers that we dye, cotton and spun and filament, polyester, monocrylic, nylon, and wool. And from a finishing, from a fabric finishing standpoint, we have two basic pipelines. We have an open width pipeline and we have a, a tubular pipeline. The <coughs> open width consists of your wovens, warp knits, and circular knits that we slit open. And uh, tubular finishing is just that. It's uh, circular knits that are finished in various body sizes. We also have napping and brushing uh, and other kinds of surface finishing. And we apply chemical, some, some chemical products for DWR purposes and flame retardants. And as Charles was mentioning, um, the company was, was uh, unearthed uh, by our late father, Paige Ashby, and late family friend, Joe Gaino, in 1995. And this is, an, this is, a, this is a picture from 97, actually. And we were stand, the, the purpose of this picture was that machine was built by Scholl and um, S-C-H-O-L-L. -L. And it was the first of its type in the U.S. And they wanted to do, they wanted to come and photograph the machine, run an ad, put it in the back of Textile World magazine, or was there a Bobbin magazine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they wanted to put it, they run, they wanted to take these pictures and run an ad in, in uh, one of these textile magazines. And, and they did that, and so we, we, it's just been kind of a keepsake for me. <coughs> and uh, so we are still a family business. Um, Hunter and I um, basically run it together. We got a bunch of teammates, like I said, back in Gaffney. But this is a cool picture that we took last year. Um, the, the, the picture on the left shows when we installed that machine, the three of us. And in the picture on the right, I, I'm literally standing in the same exact position on our floor um, 25 years later with my son to my left and Hunter's son, Hunter's sons two out of three of them, uh, to his right. Um, so that's actually what we refer to as dime machine number one. Uh, and, and so I think we now have, I think we now have 17. Does that count right? Yeah. And so, <coughs> excuse me. Very, very gradual progression to, you know, to go from 97 when we added our first machine. Um, we've taken a few out recently, which I'll talk about. Um, but it's, uh, it's, 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 been, it's been a good ride to be able to go through this evolution of growth. And so I came up with a, a brief um, timeline of what we went through, um, probably very similar to what a lot of you all went through. Um, you know, in January of 2020, the customer started calling and saying, I don't know what's going on. My customers have turned off. My customers have canceled orders. My customers are backing us up. You know, we can't get employees aren't coming in, and all of this. It was just a crazy time. And so, about a month after all that started, um, we we had traditionally been a 12-hour, seven-day operation, and uh, we found it necessary. And, and and this is six months removed from the passing of our our father. And so it was, it was a difficult time when, when he had that battle in 2019. And then just shortly right after that, this pandemic thing hit. And it was just a, a crazy time. And um, 
talk about a period of uncertainty, that's what it was. So we downsized through, mostly through natural attrition from a staffing standpoint. And then fortunately, we happened to be at the right place at the right time when the, when the mask and the gown frenzy began in March of 2020. That's what I call it, because it, it, that's exactly what it was. We've got Stacy Bridges here, and he, he heads up all of our sales efforts. And I remember him getting real creative on developing, well, I mean, the phone literally rang, started running, started ringing all the time, and we, we, we picked up more business prospects in that month than the prior five years from people that we've never heard of that were just coming out of the woodwork because they wanted to get into the mask business or they wanted to get into the gown business, and so we had to figure out, <coughs> yes, it needs to be level one, level two, level three, or what are all these things, and so I'm sure most of you guys went through a lot of that too. But that, that kind of business and those kind of creative efforts carried us through 2020. And then in January 2021, um, we saw our traditional business come back um, rapidly. And it was almost like a whiplash effect. So Hunter and I said, um, okay, the good old days are, are, are back. And so let's take this thing Let's get back off of five days, go back to seven days, let's staff up. We need to hire about 25 people. And so between February of 2021 and April of 2021, we did just that. Um, or at least we tried to do just that. We went through about 100 people uh, for a net gain of about zero. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had to gather all of our, our people together again uh, after we charged them up and said we're going back to 12 hour shifts. Mm -hmm. We go from April to June, and we gather all our people again. We give everybody a bonus, um, not because we were having a great time, but basically to say we're sorry for trying this, um, but we need to take it back down to eight hours. We have the we have the business, we have the demand, we have the equipment. We just can't find enough people to make four good teams. So rather than send all you guys out there onto a football field <coughs> with an eight-man team, we feel like we're going to play basketball with a five-man team and at least have a chance. And so that was received well, but it was hard. You know, as hard as business has always been for us, uh, to, see the, to see the opportunities in front of us and to, um, to know that we have the firepower to get it done but the inability to hire people, and you know, frankly, it just made us turn business away. First time in 20, at that time it would have been 26 years, first time in 26 years that we really had to say no to a, a large chunk of demand in business. But that's what it was. And so how do we plan to overcome that? And how do we plan to change? Is this, are we just gonna be a shrinking company going forward? How can we change this? Are we going to let this business go to our competitors? Um, so what we did, I mean, Hunter and I met and decided that we need to figure out ways to take some of the physicality out of the jobs. Working in a dying and finishing operation is not a desk job. It's not a 70 degree, you know, kind of office kind of situation. It gets hot in the summertime, and there's, there's a lot of physicality to it. It's not necessarily like working out on an interstate, but you know, there's, there's, it's good old fashioned work. And we found that we were competing with, you know, the outlet mall, the hospital, the government buildings and whatnot. Not to mention the fact that our government was paying people to stay at home all those years, and I'm sure everyone's familiar with that. But we just decided we've got to figure out a way to double down on increasing our throughput to come to push through this plant what we used to do in seven days, but we don't want to now do it in five days. And so a few examples, not all of them, but a, a few examples of what we of what we invested in to make ourselves a little bit better. The, the picture on the left is a typical pallet of 50 pound, 50 pound bags of soda ash. Soda ash is a product that we use um, in peace time to make the, the color bond and, and become part of cotton fiber. And 
for the first 26 years of being in business, we dosed Sodash into our process manually by machine would alarm and we would have to take a pallet of soda ash to a dye machine and bust open a pallet, bust open these bags. If it calls for 200, say if it calls for 225 pounds, is the equipment going to get four bags at 200 or is it going to get five bags at 250? Um, oftentimes you don't really know. And it's 100 degrees, it's hot. Um, this was easy picking. Once we found, once once Hunter discovered that there was a vendor that was willing to manufacture a liquefying and dispensing system, we could start buying, instead of the 50 pound bags of soda ash and, and the manual task of mixing them at the machine or the side tank with water and dispensing in over time, that this system right here allowed us to buy 2,500 pound super sacks of soda ash drop it into this auger, which can make a uh, liquefied solution of soda ash, keep it in this on-demand tank, and dispense it, because we have networking that talks to all the dye machines, and, we can, and it would be dispensed uh, automatically to the dye machine, on time, accurately, and no operator involvement whatsoever. So that was kind of a big step for us. It was expensive because you're dispensing to 17 different dye machines. Uh, but when that system started running, operators realized, wow, that just took a real pain in the ass off my day-to-day -day activity. So it, it was a real win. This is um, a picture of that old dye machine one that I told you had all the sentimental value. Well, this is us taking it out because even though it was sentimental to us, we needed that real estate. Why do we need that real estate? Because we had invested in a different type of machine, a different style of machine that allows us to dye not just cotton and polycotton like this one does, but filament polyester. Think about um, automotive interiors. Think about team sports active wear, team sport uniforms, things of that nature. And you can also think about um, polycot aprons, you can think about 100% cotton t-shirt, all of these things can be dyed in a machine like this. <coughs> Instead of having different machines of different architectures, this machine, these machines we dye polyester in, these machines we dye cotton wovens in. Uh, so we've, we've started adopting, and this is, we now have um, four such machines. Two of them are 1,000 pound machines, two of them are 2,000 pound machines. And so we took out uh, this 1997 model that had some limitations on what it could do and put in a 2,000 pound machine um, that had much more greater flexibility and you know we could talk about some sustainability things as well. Another thing that we did was years ago um, we put in a, a, an automated chemical dispensing system. So we are dispensing many chemicals, 24. We have 24 different chemicals. Some are in bulk tanks, some are in totes. But we have 24 chemicals that come into our plant that get dispensed to a total of 17 different dye machines and eight finishing machines. And so, I think that's right, eight or six, eight finishing machines. So, oftentimes on a startup day, you have a whole bunch of calls for large amounts of, of chemical. And this, we have one machine, one system that weighs that stuff and dispenses it to the call-it machine. And to make the jobs easier and to make the jobs more efficient and to get more done in a seven day, excuse me, in a five day week, we doubled up on our ability to dispense chemicals. So, we built this room on, and we installed um, yet another system. These two systems talk to each other. Well, they both talk to the same destinations, and they work together. If one's busy dispensing, the other one picks up and dispenses. So this is an example of how we are trying to stuff more through there in five days than seven days uh, with less wait time. <coughs> 
and obviously no operator intervention. And this just gives you a kind of a, a little bit of a bird's eye view of, of the latest uh, new machine, one of the latest new machines that we've added. It's six strands between 1,800 and 2,000 pounds per dive load. Any questions at this point? Am I okay on time? We're a little over, but we started late, so okay. we're going to well, let you go. By, by the way, the only thing standing between you and lunch is the guy in the blue hat who speaks after me. Going back to the physicality, taking physicality out of the, the jobs, we handle a lot of nip rolls. These are generally 40 to 50 pounds, and traditionally we had, we had always bagged these rolls manually. Perf tear off a perforated bag off of a roll, put the roll into the bag, put a twist tie around the end of the bag, put a sticker on the outside of the roll, pick up the roll, set it over here, go back to running the machine. So this is one of the investments that we did. We want, a, we want a machine operator to operate a finishing machine. We don't want them bagging rolls. So we found um, a company that could help us accomplish this. So, Again, taking the physicality out of the job and allowing operators to focus on quality of fabric and efficiency of, of, get, of their work day. And then this is kind of like the, the, the really big system that we put in um, that we're most proud of. Um, in our open width finishing, we've got four finishing lines. And historically, each one had, a, had an inspector had, had a, and had a doffer, perhaps two doffers, and we want, and they, those people were taking, taking off seam cuts, taking off sample cuts, and bagging the rolls, twist tying the whole nine yards. Now we've got an inspector at each of those four machines, essentially. And this system now takes all the sample cuts and seam cuts automatically, um, wraps the rolls, puts it on a common conveyor and, and discharges through a wrapper and then labeling and then um, unloads off to preset destinations with its other roles. So you literally have four finishing machines feeding different types of fabric through the packaging line all at the same time and it eventually all gets sorted out like you see here in the video. But we were able to, to take inspectors let, let them do their inspection job, and we were able to displace all of the, the, the jobs of simply cutting off seams, taking sample cuts, folding them up, putting, them, putting a piece of tape on the roll, picking up the roll, put, tearing off the perforated bag, putting the roll into the bag, again, taking the physicality out off, off of those <coughs> operators and assigning those operators to do more productive work. Again, this is another example of how we just decided that we wanted to double down, make the jobs easier. This was our highest turnover job in the plant, and it's the one that we attacked first. This is in our conference room. We just have a handful of the brands that, are, that either work with us directly or indirectly. Um, so we're very fortunate. We rely very heavily on our customers' successes and their customers. And uh, that's about all I have to say about that. got some equipment that's coming and we still got some improvements that are being made but um, we've made big strides we haven't quite hit that watermark yet but we've made <coughs> significant strides in that direction thank you for asking okay. 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 
Brian, I want to say great presentation and uh, congratulations on uh, everything that you guys have, have been doing in the automation and uh, innovation. Uh, when you double down, did, did you did you see or are you surprised that the apparel business as a whole seems to be down so much in 23 after we had so much talk as an industry about reshoring in this hemisphere? That's a good question too. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so the markets that we serve, camera, automotive interiors, flame retardant fabrics that go into career workwear or military. We do a lot of barrier metal stuff that goes to the military. Um, we do a lot of team sport uniform fabrics. Uh, we, we do some specialty made in USA retail type stuff. Some of those segments are really soft and some of them have seen no change. So I, I won't say that we have we have witnessed the same level of drop off as the uh, as the big guys have um, because we're kind of small and kind of nimble and, and we know how to chase an order when we really really need to. Uh, but yeah, I am surprised that, and I think it kind of all started when there was um, there was a news release back in the summer that <coughs> suddenly the three packs of basic underwear briefs undershirts uh, at Target and Walmart have suddenly stopped selling at the level that they've been selling at for a few years and that was like the beginning of the whole textile industry beginning to just seemingly slow down and so we have seen you know in talking with others in the industry we've got some customers and some of our business has softened up yeah, it's been a little bit of, of a surprise at the suddenness of how it dropped off late last year. And um, <clears throat> hoping that it's going to start turning. I mean, we, we notice it affects us, affects a number of our customers. Um, and we're, we have not seen um, a big improvement, but there's optimism. There's That's optimism. good to hear. Thank uh, Brian. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if you if you follow LinkedIn, Stacy puts a lot of the, the new stuff on LinkedIn, so you can see it. And that was kind of what I quartered Brian at the back six months ago. I said, hey, people may want to see what you're doing because this is our industry, and so we've got to invest in it. And I'm so proud that they've done what they've done. Carry on. So uh, that said, our last uh, speaker is George Booth. George wears a lot of hats. I'm wearing one right now. Uh, he leads Springs Creative Fire Guard Business Unit. He's a songwriter and a performing musician. For the past three years, he has served businesses as a business page simple certified business coach. He is an STA member and serves on the advisory board to the Gaston College Textile Technology Center. He's a member of the International Sleep Products Association's Sleep Product Safety Council and an elder at Forest Hill Church. He has a bachelor's degree in Spanish from Davidson College and a master's degree from the uh, Institute of Textile Technology. He's a husband of one, the father of two, the grandfather of four. He is also a founder and CEO of Major Stage Business Coaching and is speaking today in that capacity. Please welcome George. Whether we are heading for a recession or we're already in one, I think we can all agree that this may be the most challenging business climate of our lifetime. Where are your pessimists the most challenging so far? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> we all get it, though. I mean, it's hard to find and keep great people. The cost of energy is up. The cost of raw materials is up. The lead times of everything are up. People are sitting on their wallets, so sales are down. Tension is high. Sounds like really bad news, right? But we know that being inactive is not going to solve it. You can't just wait for it to get better. You have to do something. But what? 
But you shouldn't have to guess how to tune your business to growth and profit. So I'm here today as an STA member. I mean, you're my tribe, you're my people. I'm in the textbook business. I have been since I got out of school. Uh, I want to give you some encouragement today. There are some things that you can do, and what I hope to do today is give you a conceptual framework that you can use to evaluate things that you could do beginning today to tune your business for revenue and profit. If you don't know me, I'm George Booth. You can call me Geo or the real Geo Booth if you're not into that whole brevity thing. I help business leaders like you tune their business for revenue and profit. So let's, before we get started, again, I want to I want to challenge you to think about business a little bit differently. A business works like an airplane. <coughs> so we were just hearing about the pandemic experience, and you know, 96,000 businesses ceased to exist through the pandemic. So if you're here today, congratulations, you're a survivor. You're still in it. So there's hope for you. But how is a business like an airplane? And by the way, I left a, a little uh, note sheet on each of the tables, if you want that, you can jot down something. I hope to give you at least one takeaway today, to be the grain of sand that irritates the oyster enough to produce a pearl. But let's go. All right, so if a business is like an airplane, the leadership is your cockpit. The body of the airplane is your overhead. The wings are your products. The right engine is marketing. The left engine is sales. And cash flow is fuel. All of those systems have to work together or you don't have a functioning aircraft. What you've got is an exotic shaped room. But when you know how to tune the six parts of your business, you can create a business that grows like every healthy thing and works. So let's break it down. With regard to leadership, the first and best thing you can do to tune your business for revenue and profit is to make your company a business on a mission. Well, how do we do that? You unify your team around a functional mission statement. Now, I don't mean that lovely bronze plaque in your lobby, you know, the, 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 the exalted words of your founders, the thing that nobody can recite from memory. They walk past it every day, and they don't know. So we're going to use a new formula for a functional mission statement. We will accomplish X by Y because of Z. What is X? X is your top three business priorities over the next foreseeable time period, whether that's six months, nine months, 18 months, 24 months. It just has to be meaningful and memorable for you and your team. So let's just say, for example, that you're a dog groomer. I'm not going to step on anybody's toes here. Anybody a part-time dog groomer? Rock that side hustle. Go ahead. But let's just say you're going to increase sales by 25%, you're going to increase profits by 15%, and you're going to add 30 new clients by the end of this calendar year because everybody deserves to have a healthy welcome to So it's real simple. The thing that's great about it is you can make it memorable. Why only three economic priorities? Well, it's kind of a Pareto principle. Probably 80% of your business is going to come from, you know, three main levers. The other thing is that our brains are sort of wired to retain three and get kind of lost after that. I did tell you, or you heard, that I am a business <coughs> and simple business coach. So the idea is let's try to harness how people's minds work, how their hearts work, and let's use that to our advantage. Once you have that functional mission statement, you're going to define the key characteristics of an ideal teammate. What do they have to be? Well, I like people who are relentlessly optimistic. I like people who can take complex ideas and simplify them. And by the way, I have to commend the speakers today. You all did a great job of that. I mean, I, you know, I want to party with you cowboys uh, and cow ladies. Is that fair? Can I call you? I never mind. We'll talk. Uh, get clear about, the, clear about the key characteristics. And then the critical actions. What does every team member have to do every day to move us that much closer to the realization of those three financial priorities? So when you put your business, you change your stance to be a business on a mission, you're going to find it easier to attract and keep great people. We'll talk about how when we talk about overhead. The greatest overhead expense for most companies is labor, people. Now, if we're heading into a down economy, the brain dead response is, we got to cut people's pay. we got to get rid of people. Maybe. I'm not going to say that's never the answer, but that is not ever the first answer. I mean, if you're just taking on people because you're filling up the party barge, okay, that's different, but that's not business. That's a social club. So what you want to do is install a management and productivity system. The 
first part of that is to harness that functional mission statement. You see how this fits together? I mean, we're not just talking about like, oh, I've just got a boneyard of six airplane parts. We're actually stitching it together here, or bolting it, or riveting it. Put your mission statement to work. That means when you gather for any purpose, or you communicate with your team for any purpose, you lead with, and maybe conclude with, that functional mission statement. So over the next nine months, we're going to add this many dollars in sales, and this many dollars in profit, and we're going to do it for this, by this table, for this reason. Again, it helps to, to focus people. You're gonna run your company with just five meetings. The five meetings are a weekly all-hands meeting. Again, review that functional mission statement, and then you go and just report against the progress, or progress against those financial objectives. Hear from two or three departments. You know, you might have more functional areas than that, but that's the idea. Um, the next meeting is a weekly leadership meeting that follows the all-hands meeting. So again, that's to drive down into what needs to happen at a departmental level. Then there are daily 15-minute check-ins at the departmental level. So you can do it as a morning huddle. I think Vern Harnish has big, been a big proponent of that. And then what you have is weekly check-ins, one-on-one check-ins with the supervisor and the director board with specific personal objectives. So what happens is, from the greatest to the least, everybody understands their role in moving the, the uh, company forward. That helps people to stay engaged. That means that they're not going to do this quiet quitting thing or sit there scrolling on Facebook endlessly or whatever it is that people find to do when they should be working. And then uh, the other part is, uh, and I love, uh, Brian, I love what you said about the way you tried to like unburden people. You could use automation to, to make the jobs easier. To, you know, you actually replaced some human effort with mechanical effort. It's brilliant. So tie every job in your organization to the realization of those financial goals. If you can automate those non-essential tasks, do it. If you can outsource those non-essential tasks, do it. So the idea is not to get rid of people, but it's to harness everybody's effort toward moving the, the ball forward. We used to say around Springs Creative, it doesn't matter what it says on your business card, you're in sales. So when you're in front of the customer, you are the company. So this is just a, a more direct way of doing it. And then the other, this is very important. Try to make it very clear what the rewards are, what the incentives are for achieving those goals. And then you, you come through. So let's talk about products. My bet is, if you're like most companies, you've got three to five products that are really doing all the heavy lifting. Now, I understand when you're assorting, you might have lost leaders and, or, or adjunct products that sort of help you facilitate the sale or make the product easier to use downstream. But you probably have a lot of headwood in your product offering. So here's what I suggest. Know and optimize your product offering by doing an audit. What you want to do is determine that your products, that everything that's in the line is viable and profitable. And if you want to create a murder board where you, if you get down below a certain percentage and it's not supporting something else, kill it. And then what you'll do is install a new product vetting process to make sure that you're aiming at legitimate financial targets. Something that's going to support that functional mission statement and something that's going to help you to avoid getting unpleasant surprises. Oh, we didn't know it was going to add that cost. We didn't know it was going to create that inefficiency. Focus your marketing effort then on the top three to five most profitable products. If you need cash right now, and I'm, I'm going to submit to you that if the conditions are as bad as they could get, maybe they already are that bad, what you need is cash coming in. So emphasize the things that are already making you money. I mean, future products are important, and I'm not saying don't cast a vision for the future, but double down on what you're doing right now that makes you money. Let's talk about marketing. This is probably the one, I don't care how big or small your company is, you're probably not doing it right. How do I know that? Because once you start to see this stuff, you can't unsee it. What do most companies do wrong? They start with something, either trying to be cute and clever, or they start with something that's about them. So there's a sales trainer that I really, I really love, and I've learned a lot from him. He calls it wee wee in front of the customer. That's embarrassing. So what does that mean? You stand in front of the customer, well, we do this, and we do that. We were founded and nobody cares. And we believe nobody's listening. The reason is that you need to clarify your marketing message so that you begin with what the customer cares about. So we call this passing the grunt test. Do you know that human beings have an attention span that's equivalent to that of a goldfish? 
seven to nine seconds. And they're gone. <laughs> so if you're going to pass the grunt test, you're going to make it very clear what problem you solve in the marketplace, how it makes the customer's life better, and how they get it. I guarantee you that if we looked at everybody's website in here, most of you probably don't have that at the top of your website. And that's a change you can make this week. If you start doing that, you're going to start getting more interest and you're going to convert more sales. I promise. <coughs> what that will enable you to do, once you get clear on your marketing, is you're going to be able to build a sales funnel. Now look, you should all be advertising, sponsor STA meetings, advertise on e-textual communications, at the very least. Thank you. <laughs> you did great. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, if you have a sales funnel that's converting, you're going to have a direct pipeline to the hearts and minds of the people who want what you've got. And you're going to book more sales. You're going to keep those relationships warm. Maybe you're a grudge buyer. You know, if you're an HVAC guy, you know, people don't generally call the HVAC guy to say, hi, how you doing? Usually it's you know, like a plumber. I don't want to need you. I don't want to know you. But if you're top of mind, when I need you, I'm going to go to you. So this is a way. And look, I know we're all business to business people. I'm telling you it works the same way. Why? Because we're all human and we're all consumers too. This works. So if you want to cut through the clutter and all the cute and clever stuff, get clear on your marketing and then you'll, you'll break through. Let's talk about sales. Nobody fainted. I love you people. I love you. Who's in sales? We all are. All yes. <laughs> you were listening earlier. <laughs> Full marks. Yes, the way we improve sales is to make the customer the hero. Now let me take you on a little detour here. This is how story works, okay? Now think about most stories or movies or books you love. A character wants something, but has a problem because they can't get it. The character meets a guide. The guide gives them a plan, calls them to action, and then the character either puts that plan into effect successfully, and we call that a happy ending. Or they fail, and we call it a tragedy. So here's the thing. The reason I'm showing you this, if you want to be winning in business, particularly in a down economy, as the mall map says, you are here. You're the guy. You make the customer the hero, and then you come along with a plan. So how does that work in practice? You stop selling, and you start inviting customers into a story. Their story. They're the hero. You're the guy. So you begin with the customer's problem. You position your product or service as the solution to the problem. And if you're really on your game, you give them a three-step plan, maybe four steps, to get what you've got. So what problem do you solve? How does it make their life awesome? How do they get it? You can paint the stakes. Here's what happens if you don't. Anybody remember the John Lovitz uh, bit in Saturday Night Live? Get to know me! Here's a story from a man who got to know me. Right? So, grew a full head of hair and grew a foot taller. <laughs> Position your product as a solution, and then you start having more accurate sales projections because you're booking more sales, you're making more money, and you're having more fun. The economic climate's difficult, but can you believe it? You can be having more fun now. You can. So let's talk about cash flow. Now look, I'm not an accountant and I don't play one at work. But I will tell you 